Hello everyone and welcome to the One Stop Co-op Shop. Today I'm going to be doing a solo playthrough of Escape from 100 Million BC. Yeah, this is a relatively new game with not a lot of information out there at all. And so that's why I thought I'd get a playthrough out there right away of this one. So everyone can see if this is a game they want to pick up. Uh, normally I do at least four plus plays on my own before filming. This one I've only done two. Because uh, I did just get it, I think yesterday? <laughs> no, two days ago. And uh, I played it last night with my with my uh, uh, my mom and dad, and they actually really enjoyed it. Um, and so I decided, you know what, I'm just gonna do it, and we can kind of learn as we go through together. It's a fun game. It's a lot of dice chucking, but it's prehistoric, and I love dinosaurs, and I can't wait to play this with my kids because my son loves dinosaurs, so I can't wait to do that as well. Just like normal, if you'd like to uh, stick around to see how the game is set up, feel free. Otherwise, watch the video below this, and that'll be the, the uh, playthrough. You can just jump right in. Still here? Great. Let's go and set up the game. Since there isn't a ton of info about this game, I thought I might as well read you what the game is about. Your team of intrepid adventurers has embarked on history's first time-traveling expedition, only for the professor's time machine to malfunction, crashing into a lip of an active volcano and stranding you 100 million years in the past. Your supplies, along with several critical components of the time machine, have been scattered around the area. Worse, your presence in the past is causing the space-time continuum to unravel, further destabilizing the volcano that the time machine is perched atop. You must retrieve enough time machine parts for the professor to repair the machine for the time jaunt back to the future before a paradox erases you all from history. The first thing that you'll want to set up is the time machine sheet. And the, uh, what you'll do is you'll grab all the different terrain types. So there's jungle, mountains, plains, marsh, and aquatic or water uh, tiles. And on the board, you'll see where those come into play when you're uh, exploring. You're going to be exploring these tiles. Here we have our time machine, and we're going to be collecting parts and filling this up as we go through the game. Now, if you're playing at the hardest level, you're going to have to fill this all the way up with time machine parts. We're not going to do that. That would be like a four-hour game. <laughs> not really, but it would, be, it would take a long time. We're going to play on the easiest level, just because this is to show you how to play. So we'll place this token here that tells us we need to get six time machine parts before we can try and jump back to the future. We also have our emergency recall here, which lets us go back to where the time uh, machine is on the, on the board. We can jump back there, or if ever we are supposed to die, we'll use this emergency uh, recall. However, each time you use it, you're going to be pushing up the paradox tracker per whatever number it's at. So the first time we'll only move it up one, but then we'll move this up to two. And then now that we're at two, we'll, uh, if someone uses it, we'll have to move the paradox tracker up two uh, spaces and so on and so forth. Next, we're going to set up all of our decks. So we have two decks here. This is the herbivore deck, so we're going to see a lot of herbivore dinosaurs in, the, in this deck. We have the omnivore deck here, so these uh, dinosaurs are going to be meat eaters. Probably a little more scary than our herbivores, right? <laughs> but you'll see that uh, we'll be uh, encountering plenty of these. We also have our aqua deck, so our deck for water dinosaurs that we'll encounter. And we also have just a general encounter deck where we might just encounter things like boulders or, hey, maybe something actually good. <laughs> you never know. But so this is your overall encounter deck that you'll see. So these last two decks, we have the time castaway deck and the uh, equipment deck. The time castaway deck is going to be filled with lots of random people from the future and the past that we're going to have to bring an escort back to their uh, specific time rifts that are on the board to be able to send them back to their previous time. And if they die, something bad's going to happen. <laughs> We also have our equipment deck over there, which is going to give us lots of different things to help us. Uh, and the thing about this equipment deck, and I, I like this part of this game, is any equipment that we leave when, uh, when we decide to go back to the future, so when we've got all the parts and everything and we leave, if there's any equipment left in that deck, we essentially create more paradox or more bad things could happen. We might actually lose because of that. So we want to get through that equipment deck. It's almost as important to get through that equipment deck as it is to find the different parts of the time machine. Here we have all of the players that can be used throughout the game. And just like any good co-op Ameritrash fun game, we all have special abilities. 
They suggest you play with two characters for a solo play. I don't know why, but I like three. So I'm going to play three characters, even though I am doing a solo play. I'm going to do the paleontologist, the research assistant, and the investor. So let's look at those three in detail. Here we have Martin Green, the investor. He is wealthy and charming. So Martin begins the game with one extra equipment card. After setup, whenever Martin gains one or more equipment cards, he draws one extra equipment card, then chooses one of them drawn and places the other one on the bottom of the equipment deck. In addition, Marsha may automatically gain the trust of a time castaway without a check by spending one will token. And then I'll, I'll show you how all that works during the playthrough. Over here we have his stats. So he's got four for brawn or fight, three for will, and that then tells you how many will tokens you have. And will tokens are to be used in checks to roll extra dice. He moves really fast. I don't know how, but <laughs> his movement is five, and he has three health. We'll also, since we're right here, we'll look at our three equipment cards that we start with. So normally you start with only two, but he gets to start with three. His first is running shoes. Oh, that's nice. Plus one to speed checks. So any speed check, he can run away faster. That's awesome. Number two. Oh, the machine gun. Plus two to brawn checks during combat. It has three ammo tokens on it. So we'll place those on there. And after you use those three ammo, you can still keep this, but the disadvantage is you don't get the uh, benefit. You can't use it after you've used up all the ammo. It has this repel ability. Once again, I'll show you how that works during the playthrough, but that's really important. His third piece of equipment is a tasty snack cake. And as you can see, it does nothing for you. It looks cool though. The big thing it does is you see this icon here? Remember how I was telling you that at the end of the game, any equipment left in the deck, you have to increase the, the Paradox Tracker? Well, this tells you by how much you would have to increase it. So if we had left this tasty snack cake, we would have had to increase the Paradox Tracker by three at the end of the game if we hadn't found this. So still good that we have it, it just has no effect. Here we have our research assistant, and she has an ability called Weird Scientist. At the start of her turn, Anne gains one will token um, if she has fewer will tokens than her will skill. So her will skill is four, so she'll start with four of these. One, two, three, four. And if at the beginning of her turn she doesn't have four, she'll just gain one, which is awesome. I really like, these are very important to use, so I really like that. Her brawn is three, her intelligence is four, her movement is four, and her health is three. Let's look to see what equipment she gets. So she'll get just the regular two. Her first, whoa, what is that? A carbonish armor? That looks awesome. Gives her plus one to health and plus one to brawn checks. So now if she's fighting, she'll get to roll four dice instead of three, and her health is at four. And we just got another one out of the equipment deck at a level three uh, paradox. Her second, holy moly, she's all about fighting, a Sentinel Bot Beta. You can discard this card to put a Sentinel Bot on your current space. When a creature enters this space, you can roll a die, and depending on what happens, it's killed or not. And here is what those Sentinel Bots look like. That's cool. So that's hers. Let's go to the Paleontologist. Our Paleontologist, Dr. Catherine Baker, she has a pretty sweet ability. She can add plus one to any passive checks made when Catherine encounters a creature. If Catherine encounters a creature without the passive ability, she can still roll a die and discard the card if a six is rolled. And passive, like I said, we'll get to that when we get when we get through the playthrough. There's lots of little things, and we'll just go through it as we as we go through the playthrough. In addition, when making any skill checks against a creature, Catherine receives two extra dice for each will token she spends instead of one. And she starts with four will tokens. And so normally you spend one to roll one. Well, she can spend one to roll two. She has three for bronze, so she's not very much of a fighter. She's got some good uh, will for four. Her speed is only three, though, so she's slow, which makes sense. She's probably looking at everything going, this is amazing. This is geology in 100 billion BC or whatever. And then her health is three. Let's see what her two equipment cards will be. Ooh, her first one is a pistol. And this will have ammo four. So we'll place four ammo tokens on here. Also, it has the repel ability, which is great. And it gives plus one to brawn checks during combat when she uses it. So that's our first one. Let's look at her second one. Oh, first aid. 
Discard this card to heal yourself or another hero on your current space to full health. Ooh, that won't be bad. Unfortunately, that if we had left that in the equipment deck, eh, the Paradox Tracker would have gone up zero. So, but, but that's still a useful piece. Because we're not playing this game with the full six characters, we get to discard some of these equipments. Because let's be honest, getting through 40 plus cards with three characters would have been insane. So we discard 13 of these. So I'll just count them out. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So these 13 will go into a discard pile. And we can never get them because you'll never reshuffle the equipment deck. But that also helps us with that Paradox Tracker at the end of the game. So we have less that we have to, we have to find before trying to jump back to the future. I know what you guys are saying. Colin, you keep talking about this Paradox Tracker, but what is it? Where is it? What does it do? <laughs> okay, here's that Paradox Tracker on the outside of the board. What we're going to do is, based on the amount of heroes we have, we place it on a certain spot, starting spot on the board. For three heroes, it's here. For four, it'd be here. For five, it'd be here. And for six, it'd be way up there on that spot. So we're going to start here since we're starting with three heroes. Each time, at the end of each round, there's going to be a certain of, uh, paradox phase that we do, which might increase this paradox. We also can decrease it through uh, saving time castaways and sending them back through their time rifts, so that they might decrease. Every time we go past one of these icons, we have to open another time rift, and another castaway comes out. Down here, we've got our activity track, so once things start showing up, we'll start seeing uh, dinosaurs, castaways, they'll all be placed down here. And if ever we get to that volcano way down over there, right uh, at the end of the track, of the Paradox track, we lose the game. That's really the only way you're going to lose the game. There is no time machine on this board, which I think is kind of interesting. Instead, they just put a picture of the volcano. But that is where the professor is, and that is where the time, the, uh, time machine is. And so when we get those pieces, we're going to have to bring them back to the center of the board where the volcano is. Each character will start in this location. There we go. And we have to determine a first player. So we grab this little first player token and our first player is gonna be the investor, Mr. Martin. And he will always be first player. The last thing that we'll need to do is set up our first time rift because you always start with, your, with one time rift open. There are a total of six time rifts, so we randomly choose one of these. Uh, we'll grab this one. Oh, it's number one. Let's place it on the board. Here we have the time rift number one. So we'll place this here to denote that that time rift has been opened. Now we have to draw a time castaway. This is a way to start. We have found Abraham Lincoln. So Abraham Lincoln is going to be out on the board. He has an ability that happens if he encounters creatures. So some time castaways, once they meet a creature, the creature kills them because they, don't, they aren't um, able to protect themselves. But Abe Lincoln, come on, it's Abe. <laughs> he can, and so that's what's up here. It talks about what he can do. Um, then also, if you have Abe with you, he gives you a benefit. So plus one brawn to checks when Abe is with you. So we're gonna try and collect Abe and bring him to that time rift. But while we have him, we get that benefit. This too denotes how hard it is to convince him that we're not a threat. So when we meet him, we're going to have to do a check to, uh, to ensure that we're not a threat to him. This also tells us how far away from the rift he's going to be placed. So he's going to be placed five spaces in this direction away from where the time rift is. And if he's killed, we have to increase the paradox tracker by four. So we want to keep Abe safe. What we'll do is we'll place this little one on him because that helps us remember that he is from the time rift one. Because a lot of times there'll be more than one of these out. And we have to remember, we have to send him to the right time rift. Just think if we sent Abe Lincoln to our current time now. Four score and what, what's going on? <laughs> so yeah, don't want to do that. Also, Abe and any time castaway is going to be uh, shown on the board as one of these. And it's going to also have a one to denote that that's Abraham Lincoln. So let's place this on the board. So here's our time rift of one. Abraham Lincoln had to go five spaces in this direction. One, two, three, four, five. So he starts way out there in the water, <laughs> far away from our starting area. So we're gonna have to try and collect him if we can and bring him back to this location. Meanwhile, while this is out, this can have detrimental effects to us, which you'll see during the playthrough. 
And that, my friends, is the setup to escape from 100 million BC. Lots of things going on here. We're going to learn a ton as we do our playthrough. Hope you guys enjoyed, and thanks so much for watching. Thank you so much for subscribing, and I appreciate all the likes. You guys rock. So thank you again. Thank you.